Jeff Wansley asked me. Of course, Jeff is the co-founder of the Mothman Festival. And yeah, that's right. And the curator of the Mothman Museum. He asked if I would speak on John Keel, the author of the Mothman Prophecies this year. And that's quite a task, uh, to condense John Keel into less than an hour. So I have, I have a lot of help. And I have uh, some acknowledgments right off, people to thank. Doug Skinner is a man that, uh, John was ill toward his last days, he needed a lot of help. Doug uh, helped him with uh, making sure he, he was getting uh, fed and, and uh, helping him clean his apartment and so forth. A really good guy. He also started a great website called johnkeel.com. A lot of the pictures I have here today came from that. It has all kinds of uh, uh, lost correspondence, uh, uh, great photographs, and even has some of his field notebooks when he was watching some of the strange sights in the sky in the Ohio Valley. New South Syrian Publications has resurrected all these lost articles that John Keel has written over the past several decades. Great, a great, great resource. Of course, again, Jeff Wamsley, who has written two excellent supplemental books on the Mothman. Another source was uh, Brian and Terry Siege of the S-Files. They have a great uh, library of the paranormal that I used. Uh, John and Tim Frick, ever hear of those guys? Yeah! Okay. They uh, had the pleasure of uh, meeting with John Keel for hours in 2003 when they unveiled the Mothman statue. And uh, some of their conversations I'll be referring to today. And last but not least, Brent Rains, who helms Ultimate Perceptions Magazine, which is an online magazine that's been around for a long time. Brent is writing a book, a biography on John Keel. We finally have that. And uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, is, has written a foreword, and she is the publisher of the book, Visionary Living. They both gave me permission to look at the PDF files on that, on what has been done with that book for some source material. So we're going to hit the ground running here. Uh, if I don't cover up my... Uh, okay, got to make sure I got this right here. Uh, good. The early years. I'm going to do a little bit of this before we get to the good stuff. Uh, he was born March 25th, 1930. John Keel's father was a uh, was a, a band leader at the time, and what they called a crooner, you know, Bing Crosby, that kind of thing. A lot of you youngins won't know some of these expressions. Uh, his father was a voracious reader, and John got that from him. Uh, the Depression hit, they shipped John off for a while to stay with his grandparents. John's uh, uh, idol at the time was Houdini the magician and he would learn simple conjuring tricks that he would astound his friends and neighbors with. He was always fascinated by magic. He was a bit of a, uh, a scrawny kid by all descriptions. He'd be the last to be picked for the team and so forth. About 1938 he was uh, plagued by a bully and uh, not being uh, physically able to overpower the guy he used his intellect. He found a bigger kid offered him two cents a week to be his bodyguard. End of bully problem. His parents divorced. Uh, they moved to a remote farm uh, outside of Perry, New York. He spent his days doing farm chores and, and up in the hayloft reading stacks of books he got from the library. About 11 or 12, he did his first paranormal investigation. He lived in the, uh, he, he slept in the upper room of the house and he started hearing a tapping or rapping on the wall. Um, and it turned out, at first he thought it might be squirrels or something, but no, it was actually a poltergeist. Now, I might have run screaming into the next county, but what John did is run to the library. He studied everything he could on this, the ghosts, poltergeists, the occult. And instead of asking to sleep somewhere else, he confronted it head on. He tapped back, and then he started asking it questions, and it would rap back one for yes, two for no. There's not much record of what he was asking, except he did ask some questions about the war at the time. In school, he read an entire set of encyclopedias. Uh, and then what happened was he saw his name in print for the first time, and that was it. He made $5 on a poem, this is back in the 30s, he, uh, that he sold to the Hobo News. He was always in the library, electronics, radio, physics, meteorology. But he was always dreaming of, of travel to uh, Egypt and the Himalayas. Uh, his school didn't have a, a school newspaper, so he made his own. He borrowed a mimeograph machine from a minister. Now, 
for the, those of you that don't know what a mimeograph machine is, I think you could call it something like a, uh, a medieval copier. That sound right? And he made his own uh, newspaper. Had his own column. At 17 years old, he filled a box full of some stuff and went to uh, hitchhike to 400 miles to New York City and ended up in Greenwich Village. I'm neglecting my pictures here. This is, uh, he wrote for everything, including romance comic books, uh, True Confessions magazine, and just anything he could. And then he was drafted into the Korean War. He ended up in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. And he also ended up on uh, Armed Forces Radio, which was a godsend. And uh, one of the first things he did, now in, in Germany, there is a real Frankenstein's castle. So he decided to write a radio script and thought, well, let's do a live remote from Frankenstein's castle. And this was a little bit reminiscent of, uh, you know, Orson Welles did the famous War of the Worlds broadcast back in the 30s, and some people tuned in and thought it was real. Same thing happened here. People in the Rhine locked their doors. He wrote a script where the monster comes back every hundred years. And there was actually a group of MPs that went up the hill to see if the radio announcers had been, in fact, ripped apart by the monster. <laughs> Fortunately, it was not in the script. I don't know if that's a military picture or not, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> he finally got to, uh, he finally got his travel to Egypt, Tibet, and the Himalayas. And it's, this is chronicled in a book I won't spend too much time on called Jadu, which is a fascinating book. Uh, I read this actually after things like the Mothman Prophecies and Trojan Horse. He, uh, Originally, in the book, he had this great romance with this, uh, this German lady named Lita. But the editors, and he always had problems with editors, he was plagued by this all his life, decided that they didn't want a romance in the, in the book, so they hacked it out. But fortunately, in the reprinted version, the most recent one, they have restored it. That's him uh, uh, charming a snake. Now, there's a couple things I need to talk about uh, Jadu. Well, one of the things is that, in, in toward the end of it, he's talking about uh, tracking the Yeti. And he actually probably was tracking a Yeti. They could hear the screams in the de distance and so forth. This is in Tibet. And uh, other, he talked to other eyewitnesses that saw this. But he revealed in one of his uh, interviews, he said, well, when he actually got to see the creature, it was so far off in the distance, he couldn't actually be sure that was a Yeti. He thought it might have been bears. But the editor at the time thought, oh no, the abominable snowman's big these days, we're gonna make it Yeti. So again, John, John in the book, in his manuscript, had said he wasn't sure what it was, but they changed it. Ah, those, those guys. Um, John had all kinds of jobs. He was science editor for Funk and Wagnalls. He was, uh, worked for the, uh, as a consultant for the Department of Health and Welfare. Air Force Office of Technical Research. He, uh, he wrote, uh, now Merv Griffin was an old uh, uh, morning talk show host, talk, talk show host, a very lightweight. And John Keel would write, get this, ad libs for Merv Griffin. Now this is where the Fricks come in. Uh, it turns out John and Tim Frick are lost in space experts, which may mean they don't have a life. Okay, but anyway. Uh, John told them that, they, uh, that he wrote for a lot of TV shows under pseudonyms, and one was he wrote several episodes for Lost in Space. So the next time John, uh, John and Tim uh, watched the episodes, they watched with an eye to see if they could find any Easter eggs in there that might have been Keel. And sure enough, there was an episode where the Robinsons encounter a werewolf named Keel. I remember an episode when I was a kid where they, something happens and the robot becomes giant. I don't remember that one. And they're being pursued by three mysterious faceless men in black inside the, the workings of the, of the uh, robot. Keel was also fascinated by Charles Ford. Charles Ford wrote The Book of the Damned and three other books. He chronicled all kinds of high strangers like we do here. Uh, poltergeist phenomena, falls of fish from the sky, strange meandering lights. John was fascinated by him and he was influenced by him too because uh, Charles Fort believed that you can begin to measure a circle anywhere. He thought all these things were connected somehow. 
Now, John had seen a UFO when he was in Egypt. He also saw his first one when he was about seven years old. Uh, his parents were driving somewhere and he saw this large glowing sphere. Keel knew there was something to these. He didn't believe the stuff the Air Force was putting out at the time. He traveled to 20 states and talked to over 200 people that believed they had some kind of alien contact. And then there was kind of a turning point. Originally, he believed that UFOs were extraterrestrial. But the more he studied it, the more he found things didn't work out so well. In his book, Strange Creatures from Time and Space, which has been retitled the, uh, help me out here, The Guide to Mysterious Beings. That's the most recent version. He starts to talk about window areas. And he try, trying to account for the fact that these things seem to sometimes appear in an area, make footprints, people see UFOs or whatever, and then it's all gone. He hypothesized a window, which many will call a portal or a vortex. But then he took it a step further. Again, he, he began to believe that these things were connected, UFOs, cryptids, poltergeist phenomena, and so forth. He used a term that uh, has a literary device called ultra-terrestrial. And he borrowed this from Ivan Sanderson. Uh, and really, what it means is, uh, Keel did not believe these things came from off-world. He thought these things were a natural condition of the planet. And I, I don't want you to zone out on this too much, but this is kind of a, a, a key point with Keel. He, he called it beings and forces that coexist with us, but are on another time frame. They operate outside the limits of our space-time continuum, yet have the ability to cross over into our reality. He believed that the, the manifestations we were seeing weren't that important. He was looking for the cosmic mechanism behind these things. He also found that if he had a frame of reference, a certain belief, he would start getting reports that would reflect that belief. At one time, he considered the idea that UFOs were bases under the water and that perhaps there was some race that coexisted with us that lived under the water. He started getting reports unsolicited of landings where the entities had gills in their neck. Another thing that's kind of interesting, he used ultra-terrestrial interchangeably with elemental, which is uh, kind of interesting. John Keel said, the more you look into this phenomena, the more it looks bad. Do you guys remember, how many have seen the film The Mothman Prophecies? Remember the scene, Richard Gere is kind of playing a John Keel type character, and he's talking to the, the uh, infamous Ingrid Cole on the phone. He asks Indrid, what do you look like? Indrid says, it depends on who's looking. If you go back into history, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock, the Sherlock Holmes stories, he was also one of the first paranormal investigators. He wrote a book called The World of the Fairies. He firmly believed that the fairies or the elementals were real beings. And he said, the appearance of the fairies is largely dependent on the person looking at them. Sounds like John Keel. I think that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and John Keel would have had a lot to talk about. And just to, uh, again, I don't want you to zone out on this, but the last point on this, Keel thought that perhaps the only reality of this phenomenon might be these strange meandering lights. They may be the objective part of this reality, and that we have seen them throughout the ages. In ancient times, the Chinese called them dragon tracks because they believed they were attached to dragons. In later years, they were fairy lights. And then when the when witches were uh, sort of in vogue, they believed, some people would believe that, well, they saw light in the sky. Obviously, it was a witch flying on a broom carrying a lantern. These were the beliefs at the time. Same phenomena, different belief structures surrounding it. John Keel wrote, belief is the enemy. Now, some of his early writings, um, he wrote for a lot of so-called men's adventure magazines and UFO magazines. Uh, at the time, something that was very controversial, we're, we're very familiar now with what we call close encounters of the third kind, a landing of a craft or whatever, and seeing some kind of an entity or being in conjunction with that craft. Well, at the time he wrote this article, and I'll give you the name, <clears throat> excuse me. Never mind the saucer, did you see the guy who was driving? 
He chronicled a lot of these different reports that were going on at the time that even a lot of UFO investigators were ignoring. Shortly thereafter, the editor of True Magazine invited him in his office and ushered him into a corner and said, look at that. There were six full post office bags of letters, approximately 18,000, and most of them were trending toward people that believed they had some kind of a contact with some kind of an alien being or a saw one. I'm, I'm losing my uh, pictures here. That's Trojan Horse. That's the one. This is the, the one where he talks about ultra-terrestrials. And uh, this, was, uh, this was a book that really kind of turned me on my head at the time because I was very happy with the idea of the extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial hypothesis. These are just some other great pictures of John here. <clears throat> now, John had quite a sense of humor. Um, there are some, it's hard to find now, but you can find some old lectures of John Keel on DVD. And they're not very good quality, but his, uh, his intelligence and his sense of humor come through. One time, he told a story. Bear with me here. That was the uh, True Magazine I was talking about. Um, Keel lived in New York, and he had a friend that lived in one of these swank high-rise apartments. And uh, this was way back in the old days where this guy would actually leave his door unlocked. His, uh, he had a lot of high-profile friends. They would come in, they'd use his piano and typewriter and so forth. Well, they started having seances, and seances with no results. So John sneaked in one time. He got a string and a weight, and he rigged it so that he, would run, he ran the string all the way to the back of the room, to the chair that he usually sat in, so he could literally pull the string and hit a key on the piano, so it would go plunk. So the next time they had a seance, the spirit started speaking through the piano. Once for twice, two for no. So Keel kept this up for a while, and finally, his friend came to him and said, you know, John, you're a medium. And he said, well, why? He said, well, the spirits only contact us when you're here. And he said, oh, boy. So he, he kept it up because he, he didn't know how to tell the guy. So whenever he was not there, he confided in another guy, another man, to do this, to pull the string. So this went on for a while. Finally, John said, oh, I've got to tell this guy. I just, I've just got to confess. So he did. And his friend paused for a minute, and he said, no, John, no. You see, the spirits were telling you unconsciously to do this. You just didn't know it. And of course, the moral of this was that this is what John Keel was doing all his life, is trying to uh, understand what or who is pulling the string. Anomaly was a uh, unscheduled newsletter that Keel did. I have to deal a little bit with, uh, John Keel was attacked uh, for all the time, from, from the day one, when he came out with his controversial theories about this possibly not being E.T., but being something else. Uh, Gordon Crichton of uh, Flying Saucer Review, <laughs> Flying Saucer Review was a great British publication that goes back to the mid-50s. All the way up to the present, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who wrote this great uh, uh, foreword for the uh, upcoming Keel book, they nailed it. Keel was attacked often because people didn't like the message. And there are mistakes in Keel's book, so people would, would focus on those and point at that because they disagreed with him. Uh, John and Tim had long conversations, as I said, with John Keel. He revealed that uh, oftentimes editors and so forth would change his, uh, change his wording and so forth. He said he didn't even read some of his stuff because they had, sometimes it was mistakes, sometimes it was uh, on purpose. I believe, if you look in the Mothman prophecies, some of the reports are not quite right. Uh, but I think the editors tweaked some of the Mothman sightings to make them a little more uniform. Because if you look at other places that John wrote about the same sighting, it's accurate. Now, the Mothman prophecies, according to uh, Brett Rains, who, who uh, is writing the book on John, had long conversations with John Keel, and Keel said, look, if he had written everything that happened during the Mothman uh, fiasco, it could have easily taken six books. But ironically, the one book Keel wrote, they cut out half of it on the cutting room floor. Fortunately, most of that has been uh, resurrected into the Eighth Tower, which was the book that followed the Mothman Prophecies. Now, when uh, 
Keel actually reluctantly wrote the Mothman Prophecies. I think he originally tried to uh, to get it published, you know, at the, around the time, but nobody was interested. So he wrote a couple articles on Mothman. About 1973, his agent said, you need to write a book on the Mothman. And so he did. He called together stuff he had in a briefcase to kind of put it together. Now, as I said, that a lot of the uh, Mothman prophecies was left on the cutting room floor. This book, published by New Saucerian, has a lot of material that was likely in the original Mothman prophecies, and it's really fascinating to read. Colin Wilson, the great British researcher, uh, wrote a book, well, many books, but this one, Alien Dawn, he talks about his friendship with John Keel and the correspondence they had. And uh, it's, this is another really great book I recommend. Um, <laughs> Colin Wilson said of John Keel that John Keel was incapable of writing a dull sentence, and I'm going to prove that here. In, indulge me in this one quote from the Mothman Prophecies. Now, the Garuda referred to in this uh, quote is out of Hindu mythology, and John Keel saw kind of a uh, a symbolic representation of the Mothman and the Garuda. Not literal, of course. And he originally he wanted to call the Mothman prophecies the year of the Garuda. So here's the quote from the Mothman prophecies, and this is when John Keel has decided that there's all this high strangeness going on in Point Pleasant, and he's going to check it out. The year of the Garuda was at hand. A dark force was crossing over a little town I had never even heard of. Point Pleasant, West Virginia. In a matter of months, I would be arriving there like some black-suited exorcist, lugging my tattered briefcase, waving the golden cross of science. My life would become intertwined with the people of the Ohio Valley. When John Keel arrived in Point Pleasant, he was welcomed into the homes. He, uh, he met, immediately he met the uh, Scarberries and the Mallets who had been chased by the Mothman, that first uh, infamous sighting down Route 62 on November 15, 1966. A tall, humanoid winged being, about seven feet tall, grayish, red glowing eyes, and a ten foot wingspan. He met Mary Heyer, the reporter that he became friends with and a good colleague. She, uh, she was the lady that was a stringer for the Athens Messenger. And, uh, wrote the column, Where the Waters Mingle. She and John would go out and, and other people would go out to these, uh, these hot spots in, uh, in Point Pleasant, the TNT area, Chief Cornstalk Hunting Grounds, uh, Yellow's Ferry, and watch the strange lights go over. Now, Linda Scarberry, that's the, uh, that's the TNT plant, by the way, the way it used to look uh, when the Mothman was first seen. And that's the guy you might see tonight if you're on a hayride. <laughs> um, Linda Scarberry had a rough time. She was, uh, as many people that have these sightings, she was made fun of and so forth. She and her husband, Roger, had all kinds of other weird paranormal phenomena happen around them. They would hear uh, beeping sounds outside their trailer, a, a voice that sounded uh, like a, a speeded up tape recorder. There's nothing there. Linda saw the Mothman again more than once, and one time she saw it sitting on the roof across from her on her neighbor's house. Uh, there were uh, oh, one of the other things I wanted to mention about the anomaly, the unscheduled newsletter. They, they were always talking about how John, you know, why didn't he correct the things in the Mothman prophecies? Well, originally the Mothman and Trojan Horse sold terribly. He didn't have any clout to say, hey, when we get this second edition up, let's, let's rewrite it, let's correct it. But in the anomaly, this unscheduled newsletter that he had control on, he was always correcting mistakes. He would find mistakes were made in his articles or writings, and other people would write in, and he was quick to change it. So that was kind of what he, how he was wired. But other people presented differently. Also, there were uh, people that thought that Keel, that you know, Keel was pretty much an agnostic. He suggested to Linda Scarberry, who was very frightened by the events surrounding her, uh, put crucifixes in her house. Well, he told John and Tim it was because he thought it would be a placebo and it would help her. It would help her belief system and ease some of her fears. Well, sometime later, uh, there was some vicious stuff said about uh, John Keel 
that he intentionally imprinted the demonic idea on Linda Scarberry and made her very frightened. Well, this didn't, didn't ring true, so John Frick and I actually asked Linda Scarberry one time. She used to come here to the festival before she passed, and she would, uh, would answer questions from people, a very, very nice, very gracious lady, and she scoffed at that idea. She said, John suggested I put crucifixes in my house because he knew it would give me comfort. She thought really highly of John Keel. As you, many of you people know that are investigators in this field, the way people kind of stab each other in the back sometimes, some of the nasty rumors that go through, this kind of thing really has infuriated me. I have to say, I'm a little envious. I never got a chance to meet John Keel, and here this guy spent hours with him. Where, where is John and Tim anyway? I'm right here. Uh, can you guys please leave? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. No, it really, uh, they really helped a lot with, uh, uh, there's so much more they told me that I won't be able to get into, but uh, that was, it had to have been fascinating to spend all that time. But how many hours did you spend with John, do you think? Uh, man, I would have loved just to shake his hand. Okay. Now, I'm going to get into some of the stuff that happened in the Mothman prophecies. And as we go through this, the, I want to think of the word as phantasm. You know, as human beings, as researchers, we want to put things in categories. We want to understand things. We want to, uh, uh, well, put things in, in, in boxes, not just boxes, but we want to uh, be able to explain them scientifically. If you look at the events in the Mothman prophecies, you just, nothing like that can happen. We try and put it in an extraterrestrial framework. It doesn't seem to work. We try to put Mothman in purely a biological creature standpoint. It doesn't seem to work. So as I go through these different things in, in prophecies, keep that in mind, that it's, it's almost, uh, well, a, a phantasm is the word I'm going to use. Early November, two men were driving south on uh, Route 77, and they were stopped, they were, as this strange elongated craft came by, stopped in front of them, and landed, they stopped their car, some normal looking man got out, with his arms folded, a smile on his face, and started asking them questions like, who were they? Where were they going? And what time was it? Now, I don't know what this was, but it doesn't sound like a visitor from another planet. So this guy wasn't gonna tell anybody about this bizarre experience. But, but he started having bad dreams, he had started having nightmares, and he started hitting the bottle, which is extremely uncharacteristic of this gentleman. He went to Mary Heyer, he said, I gotta tell somebody. She got John Keel involved in on it. And he finally he decided, he said, you know, uh, let's not print this. He said, you know, that scientist fella told me. And John said, what scientist fella? He said, well, he seemed to know what he was talking about. Uh, somebody had come to him. Now, this guy had never reported this to anybody uh, but uh, uh, Mary Heyer. And she didn't even know about it at that time. So who was this mysterious figure? And so John Keel filed this away and said, okay, well, we're not going to report that one because there's, there's nothing, we can't, uh, can't pinpoint it. And then very shortly after that, a, a very famous man now, Woodrow Derenberger, was tra had been traveling down the same route the same night, had virtually the same experience. Only his, uh, the gentleman he talked to, uh, called, uh, said he was Andrew Cole. Indrid uh, had uh, about the same kind of pointless conversation with him. Uh, he did tell him he was from the uh, galaxy of Ganymede. Ganymede is a moon of Jupiter. When you get into these, some of these contacts and so forth, we, we try to, and, and get a narrative sense out of them, but they don't make any sense. And then, there was another incident in Gallup, uh, across the river in Galapagos. A woman named Mrs. Bryant had another similar experience with uh, two entities like that. Again, they're pointless conversations. You, you wonder, you have to wonder what the source is, what's the meaning of it. John Keel had kind of a catchphrase. He, uh, he actually developed a, uh, if somebody had an experience, he had all kinds of other questions to ask them because he knew there was so much going on. His, the catchphrase was, ask the contactee what they had for breakfast. Now, of course, it wasn't literal, 
but he, he said that uh, you have to find out about the individual. Don't worry about whether the craft has a dome on it or how many portholes. Don't worry about whether the creature has hairless or has hair all over it. You have to find out about the individual because there are patterns between people. He found that uh, uh, individuals that are psychic or have latent psychic abilities are far more likely to have these experiences. In fact, somebody that might see a creature or a UFO uh, might also, I mean, one that would see a UFO might also be prone to seeing a Bigfoot and vice versa. He, uh, these people all would, would have, many of these people would have a lot of very strange phenomena uh, surrounding them as well. A, uh, a, a, a Reverend Anthony DePaulo, Boardman, Ohio, July 1967, Kind of a classic close encounter of the third kind. He hears a strange noise, he wakes up, gets a telepathic message to look outside, sees a strange uh, entity standing out in front of his house. He goes outside, the guy's got a helmet on, he's got a, uh, a suit on, a little bit like an astronaut, but more tight fitting, it's glowing. Has another kind of a mundane conversation. Uh, DePolo sees, doesn't actually see a craft, but he sees a strange light in the sky. And then that's it. Now, uh, a lot of investigators would have left it at that. But John Keel knew there were other questions to ask. He found out this person had had electrical phenomena going on in his house for months. Beeps coming from his television set. Very much like Merle Partridge did. That's the man who lost his dog Bandit to some strange lights around the Mothman period. He had uh, all kinds of phone problems. He would get strange phone calls with distant voices. Um, and then one night, then he found out he had an outbreak of poltergeist phenomena in his house. This is just a guy that saw supposedly an alien, as strange as it was, land in, his, in front of his house. One night he heard the sound of a baby crying. Now this is, is apparently one of the things that does show up in some aspects of paranormal phenomena. Imagine waking up and hearing a baby crying in your house. You can't find the source, and obviously there's no baby there. There's a linear. Now I mentioned phantasms. When I go through these, these other aspects of the, of the Mothman prophecies, I want you to think of this as if we're watching the previews of the upcoming Mothman prophecies. Just we're going to get a few scenes, a few flashes of what happened there. A doctor and his wife are driving down a country road in a bad snowstorm. He sees a huge caped figure struggling through the snow. They stop. The figure vanishes. Keel reports limos with deeply tanned men with pointed features come to the door and claim to be census takers, missionaries, and Bible salesmen in the back roads of West Virginia. These mystery men, these men in black, often have high cheekbones, dark complexions, Sometimes something of an Asian countenance, but not Asian. Harold Harmon, Point Pleasant police officer. He's out in the TNT area. You know the ponds out there. He sees a large craft hovering over one of the ponds late one night. It's completely quiet. It drifts away and has no idea where it went. The Lilly family, Camp Conley Road. Camp Conley Road is about the southernmost extremity of the TNT area where the Mothman was first seen, the McClintic Wildlife Area. They have all kinds of strange lights going over their house during the time of the Mothman. Their daughter had a visit by an apparition in her bedroom. A family of seven on Long Island. Now, John Keel was uh, investigating stuff on Long Island and other places at the same time. A family of seven on Long Island. They see a UFO come down. A black car pulls up. Two normal-looking men come out of the UFO, go into the black car. The black car drives away. The UFO takes off. A businessman in Point Pleasant steps out on his porch, sees the, the Mothman, the seven-foot creature, standing on his front lawn. He goes into a trance for 10 minutes, doesn't know what happened. Marcella Bennett, one of the famous Mothman witnesses, she and her brother go to the Thomas's house in the TNT area. They, the, the parents aren't home, just the children, so they decide to leave. This 
figure rises up from the ground, the Mothman. They run into the house. They, should, they lock the doors. This thing, whatever it is, walks back and forth across the porch, and they see it looking through the, the windows. Mrs. Kelly, she goes to, in March 1966, goes to pick up her children from the Point Pleasant School. She looks up in the sky and sees a classic egg-shaped object in the air. Doors open on the side. As her children are meeting her in the car, she gets them, she sees that this, this, uh, there's an entity suspended outside the craft in a silver suit, long flowing hair, looking down at the children. Once she, they get in the car, she looks up again, and it's gone. The vision, the apparition, the whatever is gone. She looked at that in a, John Keel said, in a religious context. So how do you, how do you process these things? This is why I call them phantasms when you get into the Mothman prophecies of all the things that happen. John Keel, one of the places that he went to go uh, uh, look for these things, there was a lot of activity in the Chief Cornstalk wildlife area. And he saw these uh, strange purple lights that he talks about in the Mothman prophecies. What, what he doesn't talk about is, you hear about in one of his lectures, is that uh, they were about the size of basketballs, and about six of them came down one night and surrounded him, just went around him. And this happened more than once. That same night, the, the whole the whole holler, the, the uh, valley, turned purple, this the purplish glow. So the next day, he went to the farmer in the area and said, have you ever seen this happen before? He says, yes, this happens all the time, since I was a kid, but I don't ever go there, because one time, one of his dogs ran into this purple forest, so to speak, and never came back. Keel had a system of spot checks because, you know, Keel said, look, people look at me as the hotshot UFO investigator. They come and tell me their story. Well, sometimes people come and tell a story that might be uh, a little bit embellished. So he would just randomly go to houses and ask people if they had seen any unusual phenomena. He picked a house north of Gallipolis one time. The guy came to the door with a shotgun and told him to get the hell out of there, and he did. The next day he came back with Mary Heyer because everybody knew Mary Heyer. Mary Heyer talked to the man, they came out, and he was apologetic. He said, you know, some, uh, my neighbor, at least I thought it was my neighbor, called me about 10 minutes before and said this crazy man was, was on the loose wearing with a beard. So that's what he thought John Keel was. Now, John Keel picked this house out at random. How could anybody know? And the guy also said that it turned out it wasn't his neighbor because his neighbor was out on his tractor doing farming. But in further questions, it turned out that there was a, some kind of a strange light that went over this guy's property a few days before. It scared his cows so bad that they went through the electric fence. It also burned out the circuit box in his barn. Keel was in contact with many individuals that firmly believed they were in contact with some other intelligence. He called them silent contactees because they were completely unconcerned about anybody believing them. They, they, they uh, were given sometimes missions by this entity, sometimes through automatic writing or channeling or whatever. Uh, it's, I'm not sure that they ever actually encountered a physical being, but that's up for debate. Uh, they were given predictions sometimes that would come true. And they were always reporting to John Keel the things that were going on. One woman was sent on a mission in Brooklyn to find a mysterious crucifix that she never found. There's a real kind of a trickster aspect to this, or perhaps it's something where the message is clear, but we're not receiving it properly. A man on Long Island had, been, had received several predictions that came true, and then there was the big one. Uh, he was told that uh, something terrible was gonna happen, but the evacuation was coming from the Space Brothers, and of course, it never did. Now, a lot of, if you re have read the Mothman prophecies, you know that John Keel went through all kinds of uh, havoc. A lot of the stuff does seem to be, might have some kind of paranormal connection. But some of it certainly was of human intervention. He had a lot of trouble with the IRS and uh, the FBI and, uh, and so forth. Um, 
a lot of harassment with the phone company and the IRS. Um, it turns out, Don, in one of these many articles that have been republished, he had an uh, interview with Don Ecker of UFO Magazine. He told Don Ecker, now this might have been in the original Mothman Prophecies, I don't know, but he, uh, he had written a critical article on the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover. Two weeks later, a lot of the stuff that you hear that you read in the Mothman Prophecies took place with the uh, with his phone bills skyrocketing and uh, the IRS plaguing him. But there were some other, some very strange things that happened. Keel would pick out a hotel at random that he just decided going to in the next few minutes. And there'd be a whole horde of messages there for him, as if somebody was anticipating him. Now, he, he admits uh, when, uh, when he was interviewed on Art Bell uh, on Coast to Coast AM when he was promoting his movie, he, uh, he talks about how the, the, the movie really captured the paranoia that he felt. And he, there's a chapter called Paranoiacs Are Made, Not Born. Uh, he really was internalizing a lot of this stuff, felt that something was building. These messages all started to line up. The sign of contact is we're all talking about some, what they called an EM effect, electromagnetic, I don't know, that was scheduled for mid-December 1967. There would be days of darkness all over the US. And this would happen when, when President Johnson lit the Christmas tree, because after a while it crystallized to December 15th. Now, a lot of people in the TNT area, I mean in the Point Pleasant area, were having bad dreams. <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Tomlinson was one of the last ones to see the Mothman in, uh, in uh, the TNT area. Saw it walking, walking very quickly, she said, almost like a robot. Strangely enough, Keel got some uh, uh, reports earlier that saw the Mothman very close and said it sounded like and it had a humming noise or something mechanical coming from it, just to throw another wrench in the work to try and figure out what this thing was. But this lady was also having bad dreams. Uh, Mary Heyer was having dreams about Christmas packages floating on the river. Uh, there was a real foreboding. And some of these silent contactees would predict a plane crash, it would happen. So Keel said he, he, he bought a book, line, and sinker. He was in his apartment in New York City and when December 15th came. And of course, we know what happened. It wasn't a, an EM effect. The bridge collapsed at Point Pleasant. We lost 46 people. John Keel was frantic. He was on the phone, got, got a hold of Mary Hire by 2 a.m. to make sure she was all right. He asked about the other people. John was, you know, while he made certain connections and, and made certain inroads, he was unable to solve the mysteries of the Garuda. He was unable to solve the mysteries of Mothman and all the same strange things that happened in Point Pleasant. He was a journalist. He covered these events. He dedicated the, uh, there we go, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, that's Mary Ellen Guiley, by the way. Rose Royce Mary Ellen Guiley, by the way. Um, he dedicated to the Mothman prophecies to Mary Heyer and the people of West Virginia. And when he said he was, his life would become intertwined with the people of West Virginia, he was right. Now, not too long ago, John Keel was being forgotten. Uh, when Art Bell interviewed him, Art Bell knew nothing about the Mothman, and I couldn't believe it. Uh, around the same time, there was a, uh, a, a uh, convention scheduled in Pennsylvania, where they advertised John Keel was supposed to be there, but I, I don't think so. I think they were, they were stretching the truth. But a very well-known paranormal talk show guy was talking about the people that were going to be there. And he named them off, and then he said, you know, uh, there's going to be a UFO guy there, but uh, uh, I don't remember his name. And I thought, he didn't remember John Keel's name. I mean, I was the guy that was there to buy the Mothman Prophecies in hardcover with the dust jacket when it came out. I mean, I was waiting for it. But now all that's changed. His books are all back in print. All these great articles have been resurrected. Rosemary Ellen Guiley in the foreword too, 
the new John Keel book. John Keel was a man way ahead of his time. He saw the big picture, the interconnectedness of all paranormal phenomena. When I was at a MUFON symposium last fall, we were listening to David Politis. How many know who David Politis is? The missing 411 guy. Chronicles these bizarre disappearances. He was talking to Stan Gordon, another friend of the Mothman Festival, and he said, you know, he stopped what he was saying, he said, you know, John Keel was way ahead of his time. Nick Redford, who's written uh, one of his more recent books, Black Diary, he's talking about John Keel, John Keel's descriptions and uh, of some of his findings on the men in black. Nick Redford writes, Keel was always ahead of his time. In whatever afterlife domain he now dwells, he probably still is. Keel finishes the Mothman prophecies this way. After spending a lifetime in Egyptian tombs, among the crumbling temples of India, the lamasseries of the Himalayas, endless nights in cemeteries, gravel pits, and hilltops everywhere, I have seen much, and my childish sense of wonder is unshaken. So, what I would like to uh, what I would like all of you to do is go out and seek out John Keel's writings. They're fascinating. And just one other thing. Uh, full disclosure, this beverage here is uh, approved by state, local, and federal officials, and uh, Ashley Wamsley. Um, what I want you to do is next time you're out raising a beverage, doesn't have to be a, an adult beverage, I want you to toast John Keel. Here's to John Keel, a man that saw thought so far outside the box that we have to come up with a new expression of outside the box. A real trailblazer. A man who, according to Rosemary Ellen Guiley, saw the big picture, the interconnectedness of all paranormal phenomena. And what I say, thought, uh, He was a real trailblazer in a time of fixed and stagnant thinking. The man who laid down a solid foundation for following generations to emulate. Here's to John Keel, the mentor I never knew. Everybody say, here, here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Shameless promotion time, sorry. <laughs> I have a book almost. I have a chapter in this book called Weird Wing Wonders, edited by Timothy Green Beckley. It's all about different winged creatures, including the Van Meter Visitor, which you'll hear about in a couple hours. Um, I have my article on there. My, my chapter is no surprise about Mothman and the Mothman Festival. And I'm in with a very good company like Brad Steiger and so forth. Uh, I'm also part of a uh, I'm going to be on a web series called Roads Beyond the Known with some really good friends. It'll be debuting this September. We'll be talking about things like the Serpent Mound and Point Pleasant. And I'm on a, uh, I'm on, I do a spot on a, a, a radio show called Mil uh, Mac Maloney's Military X-Files. Uh, and a young lady that's also here, Emily Minnemeyer, is on with me often. Uh, you can see I have the t-shirt. I got the radio gig. Uh, unfortunately, the logo's on the back, so my personal photographer, John, has to take pictures of me looking at stuff all the time. <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> Actually, I didn't think we'd have time. We do have a time for a couple of quick questions, if you uh, would like. If not, no problem. It's very hot up here.
Allison asked a good question because it was in my notes and I missed it. Uh, originally, John Keel talked to over 100 witnesses of the Mothman, and they're all generally the same. I've spoken to about six of the original witnesses. Some of them saw something a little bit different. Um, as in any case, they're not all going to be the same. I'm not sure the Mothman, whatever this thing was, what, if it was really some kind of a interdimensional creature or ultra-terrestrial, if it actually had the same shape all the time or presented itself the same way. But originally, Keel had, was convinced there was really something to this because it was uh, over 100 people. I had a chance to talk to Linda Scarberry, uh, one of the key witnesses. But I also talked to Tom Urey. Tom Urey did not see the Mothman per se. He saw a giant bird-like creature about, with about a 10-foot wingspan. And uh, uh, a little story about Tom Urey. Uh, a lot of people knew Tom. Uh, around. He used to come all the time to the festival and talk about his experiences. He told me, he said, you know, when I, I used to tell people I was from West Virginia, they looked down to see if I was wearing any shoes. He says, now, they just ask me about the Mothman. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.